Well, a very good morning to you on this Sunday morning. It's a joy for me to welcome you to our service. Uh, let's uh, worship God and our call to worship this morning is in Psalm 89. Psalm 89, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, who reigns on high, we come into your presence to worship you and to sing your praises. Ever aware of, uh, of our deep need for you, a deep sense of our need for a cleansing, uh, our need for renewal. Thank you that in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have life, we have hope, uh, we have an advocate with you, the Father. We rejoice this morning that now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that we have been set free through uh, the death of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now may uh, the meditation of our hearts and the words of our lips be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Continue on in our presence, we pray, and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Friends, again, if you're just tuning in this morning, it's, a, it's, a, it's great to welcome you, warmly welcome you. Uh, this is for Droz Free Church, uh, and we're very delighted that you have been able to, to worship with us. A couple of notices this morning. Um, the elders have met and discussed uh, various things and one of the things that we discussed was the Christianity Explored course which we've been talking about recently and we've decided that it wouldn't be practical to start uh, as the summer holidays are, are about to begin. It wouldn't be practical to start the course immediately so we've set a date for the 20th of August, the 20th of August that we will begin running the course and that gives us plenty of time to prepare uh, to run the course. In the meantime, uh, pray about the course, pray uh, that we would have opportunities to tell people about the course. Uh, the course primarily, I've heard a couple of people say that they know nothing about Christianity Explored. Uh, the course primarily explores the person of Jesus Christ. You know, some uh, courses that you do are very much about Christianity or about the Bible. Um, uh, Christianity Explored is on Mark's Gospel and it explores the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, uh, and the claims of the Bible about Jesus. Uh, and so we're going to begin that course on the 20th of, of August, invite people to do the course, do the course yourselves if you want to, uh, and uh, we have lots of time to prepare. Uh, for that. Uh, we're going to sing our first uh, worship item this morning uh, and that's hymn which is very much about the church, that the church is one foundation, uh, Mission Praise 640 if you have Mission Praise with you and you're listening in on the phone again a, a warm welcome to those who are listening on the phone and uh, it's good to have you with us. Uh, Mission Praise 640 the church is one foundation. Let's worship God.
Well, boys and girls, uh, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us in the Bible that it's better to give than to receive. And it's good to give gifts. It's, it's good to, to give uh, presents to people. And our faith, uh, our daughter Faith has been given various presents and some of them have been big presents and some of them have been small presents. Uh, and one of the things that she was given was, was this little toy Pinocchio, uh, which she really, really loves. It's, a, it's one of the gifts that she spends a lot of time with and um, plays with it um, a, a lot of the time. Uh, I'm going to read a story today which is about a present and it's quite a, a strange present as we're going to learn in just a moment. It's a strange present. It's a story about uh, Abraham and Isaac. I wonder if, you've, if you can remember it or I wonder if you have heard about it. Um, we turn back to our Jesus Storybook Bible and uh, let me start reading um, this, this fascinating story. Uh, the, God knew that his secret rescue plan would only work if Abraham trusted him completely. God had to make sure Abraham would do whatever he asked. So a few years later, God asked Abraham to give him a present. Abraham liked giving presents to God. He gave God his animals. They were called sacrifices. And they were a way to say, I love you to God. But this time God didn't want a lamb or a goat. God wanted Abraham to give him something more, much more. He wanted Abraham to give him his son, his only son, the son he loved, Isaac. But his, uh, put his boy on the altar and kill him as the sacrifice? How could God want him to do such a terrible thing? Abraham didn't understand. But he knew that God was his father who loved him. And so Abraham trusted him. Early the next morning, Abraham and Isaac set off. They climbed the steep, stony trail up the mountain. Isaac carried the wood on his back. His father carried the knife and the coals. Papa, Isaac said, we have everything except we forget the lamb for the sacrifice. Sorry, forgot the lamb for the sacrifice. God will give us the lamb, son, Abraham said. They built an altar and laid the wood on top. Abraham asked his son to climb on top of the wood. Isaac didn't understand, but he knew his father loved him. And so he trusted him. He climbed up onto the altar and Abraham tied his boy to the wood. Isaac didn't struggle or try to run away. He just lay there quietly and didn't make a sound. Everything was ready. Abraham took the knife. Tears were filling up in his eyes. Pain was filling up his heart. His hand was shaking. He lifted the knife high into the altar. Uh, sorry, into the air. Stop, God said. Don't hurt the boy. I want him to live and not die. I know now that you love me because you would have given your only son. Abraham felt his heart leap with joy. He unbound Isaac and folded him in his arms. God's sobs, great sobs, shook the old man's whole body. Scalding tears filled his eyes, and for a long time they stayed there like that, in each other's arms, the boy and his dad. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Suddenly, Abraham saw a ram caught in some brambles, the sacrifice. God had given them what they needed just in time. The ram would die, so Isaac didn't have to. And so Abraham sacrificed the ram instead of his son. And as they sat there on the mountaintop, watching the embers of the fire die in the cool night air, the stars above them sparkling in the velvet sky, God helped Abraham and Isaac understand something. God wanted his people to live, not die. God wanted to rescue his people, not punish them, but they must trust him. 
One day, someone will be born into your family, God promised them, and he will bring happiness to the whole world. God was getting ready to give the whole world a wonderful present. It would be God's way to tell his people, I love you. Many years later, another son would climb another hill, carrying wood on his back. Like Isaac, he would trust his father and do what his father asked. He wouldn't struggle or run away. Who was he? God's son, his only son, the son he loved, the Lamb of God. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? The story of, of Abraham and Isaac. And it does remind us of Jesus who died on the cross for us because God loves us. Well, let's turn in the Bible to Acts and chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, as we continue on in our series in the book of Acts, uh, we're in chapter 6. And let me read um, the uh, first seven verses of Acts in chapter 6. And please feel free to open up your Bibles and um, read along with me. Acts and chapter 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Permanus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. This is the inspired and an errant word of God, and we pray God's blessing on that reading. Well, as a young boy, one of the programs that I really enjoyed was the A-Team. Uh, if, you, if you know the A-Team, you'll know that there were four characters, four very different characters in the A-Team. Remember Hannibal Smith, he was the leader, charismatic guy. Uh, then there was Face Man, who was very suave and cool. There was Mad Murdoch, and there was B.A. Baracus, uh, who was my favorite. But the emphasis there was the team, it was a team effort. Um, here, uh, you know, we, in, in Acts, we, we come across the, the, the church, which was the collective. Uh, Christians belonged to a group. When you became a Christian, you, you came into the church body and you began, you, 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 you belonged to, to the group. Uh, the church is interlocking, isn't it? it it's interdependent. Uh, we rely on each other. There's no, there's no such thing as, as, as an individual. Somebody once said that you cannot know God until you are deep in community. And I, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. We cannot know God until we are deep into community. We cannot know God and have a relationship with God uh, unless we are in the church and in deep into community. The Spirit inhabits us collectively. Uh, collectively coming, coming, uh, coming uh, about us. Uh, I very early on in my Christian walk, I was befriended by a man who I worked with, and the man said to me one day, he, he said, "You know, you don't actually need the church." I was going to a, a big church in Inverness at the time with Kirstine, uh, and he said to me, and he kept on going on about the fact that, I, that, that him and his wife don't really need the church. He said, "Come and join us for a Bible study." Uh, all you really need is your Bible and you can have a relationship with God. And looking back, I, I realize how dangerous that was. 
how utterly dangerous it is uh, to not um, to to not be in in the church as as a Christian. Uh, you know, Acts tells us that the deeper we are into church community, the closer we are to God. If you take a coal out of the fire and put it by itself on the edge of the uh, on the edge of the fire, it quickly loses its heat. Uh, and yet, if you keep the coal together, you, you you get the heat source. You get you get the source of that uh, that heat coming out. And so, it's the same with us as Christians. Uh, we need to be in the church body. It's not just two things about the church this morning. First of all, the unity of the church and the good that is achieved. The unity of the church and the good that is achieved. And secondly, the authority of the church and the order it needs to thrive. First of all, the unity of the church and the good that is achieved. In, in verse 1 of chapter 6, we, we come across a problem. Uh, there is a problem with the distribution of, of food uh, to the, 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 the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews. Now, just imagine for a moment, um, contemporary food bank, be it Blyswood or, or, or one of the other food banks, and they're giving food out to the community. And, and one of the groups in the community, say for example sake, some Eastern Europeans, uh, Polish brothers and sisters, begin to complain that they're not getting, uh, the, 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 getting the, the same amount of food as another group. So we have a similar situation here uh, in, 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 in the passage here. Uh, there is complaint, these allegations of neglect from a section of the church, the, the Grecian Jews against the Hebraic Jews. Uh, and, and, and there's probably little truth in the allegation for what it matters. Uh, there's probably little truth in this particular allegation. Maybe mistakes were made. We're, in, we, we're imperfect in the church, aren't we? But what, what this really shows us is that uh, as the church was growing, we see at the beginning of chapter 6 in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained. The church was growing. Things were happening in the church. God the Holy Spirit uh, was drawing people to himself and people were, were, were being added to the church in their thousands. And what this shows us, or one of the things that it shows us, is that as there is growth, as there is change, as the, the kingdom of God increases, as God is being glorified in the work that the church is doing, this uh, and the church will always be a target for Satan. Uh, it will always be a target for Satan, and added to that is the nature of sin. I remember one of my mentors, a minister, when he spoke about marriage, he said that marriage is between two sinners. And I always remember that. Marriage is, is, is between two sinners. And where two sinners are involved with each other, there will be difficulties. There will be friction there will be the need for reconciliation at times. And so these difficulties arise in the church that needed to be overcome. The church moves very quickly. The apostles and leadership in the church, they move very quickly and they do overcome the problem. What do they do? They, they, they appoint deacons to handle the distribution of food. That's what a deacon is. That word deacon simply means to serve. And so deacons, seven deacons were chosen to do the distribution of the food, to, to handle the, um, the, the, the practical matters in the church. And the apostles, contem contemporary elders, when we're thinking about the church, would deal with the word and prayer. One commentator said this, which, which made me stop and think, good laws have taken their beginnings of evil matters. Say it again. Good laws have taken their beginnings of evil manners. Something, so, something, something evil, I know that's a pretty strong word in this context, but something bad is going on. There's friction between these two people groups. Um, but good comes out of it. Good comes out of it. You know, we're going through the coronavirus and we're going through all these changes again as hopefully we're coming out of the coronavirus and, and lockdown uh, begins to begins to ease and we begin to, to, to come out of our homes. 
And there are many reasons that we won't want to remember this time. It's been very difficult for almost everybody. So we won't, we won't want to remember it. And yet there has been some good that has come out of the lockdown. There has been some good that has come out of it. Important lessons have been learned. Uh, meaningful relationships have been forged through this time, be it on the internet, on Zoom, or whatever it is. Relationships have been made and forged. For many, a, a reset, resetting of priorities. God has caused all of us, most of us, if not all of us, to reprioritize and to think about what our priorities are. What are our priorities? We have been forced to take a step back and think about uh, how fast we're living our lives. Uh, who is it that comes first in our lives? And so we're thinking here about the unity of the church and the good that is achieved. Uh, there's something that could be over overlooked here, and that is the unity that we see in the church. Th there is unity here. People from diverse backgrounds that are within this one organization. Uh, I was thinking uh, about uh, um, the, what we're told about Christmas 2000, uh, sorry, um, 1914. Uh, when the Germans and, and, the, uh, and the Allied forces were, were opposing each other and they were in their own trenches. And the story goes that at Christmas time, um, 1914, the two sides, um, not officially, there wasn't a truce officially, but the two, two sides in, in either trench decided to have a truce temporarily and unofficially. And so we, the story goes that they played football together, they exchanged gifts, and they spent some time together. The, the church is, uh, there is unity in the church, different backgrounds, different ethnic groups coming together. Uh, one of the more diverse congregations in the free church is Govan Hill. And Govan Hill has various people groups that, first of all, they find themselves in a, a an area of diverse ethnicity, but in the church itself, they're people from the Roma community, they're, 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 they're local people, they're from Asian people from Asian community, and so there is this, uh, this, this ethnic diversity within the church. And so the, the unity of the church and the good that is achieved. Let's notice secondly, however, the authority of the church and the order it needs to thrive, you know, across the water from, from Shannonry Point um, at the base of Fort Rose. You look across to Fort George and, and it looks like a, an impressive uh, um, army building. Uh, but just ma imagine for a moment somebody that has been recruited from a young age into the army, perhaps even ending up in Fort George. Uh, a young person, who, a young person uh, with a chaotic lifestyle, think of a person with long hair, um, they, they go into the army and the first thing that, that hits them in the army is, is, is the need for discipline and waking up early in the morning and having a structured day and having routine. And so they come into a different situation of, of, of order, um, of, um, of routine. You know, God uh, it comes into our lives when we, we come into the church and the church is um, to, to a certain extent there, there, there is order, there is structure, isn't there? God brings order into our lives. Think back to before you were converted, and I think back and I, and I see chaos and I see disorder. And, and, and we come into the church and, and we, 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 we meet God and we grow closer to God, hopefully, and God brings order into our lives. The problem in the, 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 this New Testament church in Acts 6, it was quickly resolved. Deacons were appointed and they began to do the distribution of, of, of the food. What was the criteria of, of the choosing of these men? Well, they had to be men of good repute. They had to be men who were full of the Holy Spirit and they had to be wise men. Three criteria. The, the, the elders... Uh, or the, the apostles in this, this case, elders in a church, 
uh, primarily have the role for word and prayer. It's not their only role. There are other things that they do, but primarily the word of God and prayer. That doesn't mean that they are the spiritual elite better than anybody else. It simply means that they have different roles to other people in the church. But there, there is order in this New Testament church. Uh, there is structure. And the result of this in, in verse 7, interestingly enough, is that the word of God spread. Uh, the word of God spread. The church was growing. But who is the authority of the church? Well, God is ultimately the authority of our church. Uh, how does God speak to us? God speaks to us through his word, doesn't he? And so this New Testament church, th there is the priority of scripture, the priority of the word of God. The question three of, of the Shorter Catechism says, what do the scriptures principally teach? Well, the answer to that is the scriptures principally teach that what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. How do we make sense of the world in which we live? How do we know how to live our lives? Well, we know by the word of God. Um, Psalm 119 verse 105, the, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. How do, I, how do I make sense of this world? I make sense of the world through the Bible. You know, you take an issue like racism, which is uh, on our TV screens, Black Lives Matter. We see the, uh, we, we see the, um, the posters on, on the street. Uh, we see it on the news uh, most weekends now. Uh, take an issue like racism and the Bible not only helps us to understand the issue of raci ra racism, it explains the issue of racism. Uh, I, I read a book written by John Stott some time ago and he tackles the issue of, of racism in, in, in this book. Uh, and he takes Act 17, remember Paul talking at the Areopagus and he takes Act 17 and, and he comes up with four points related to racism. And the four points are these. First of all, the unity of the human race. We're all equal. We're all equal in the eyes of God, made in the image of God. <clears throat> Secondly, the diversity of ethnic culture. Ethnicity, the diversity of ethnicity. We come from different backgrounds. We have different skin colors. Uh, ethnic diversity, this diverge, divergence, this difference that we have in the world. There is ethnic diversity. Uh, notice th thirdly, the finality of Jesus Christ. And John Stott points to the fact that every single one of us are on a level playing field. And that we are under the condemnation of God because of sin. And yet in Jesus, Paul tells us that there is now no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Um, and so the, the level playing field of sin and yet the finality of Jesus Christ is that he is the only one, only way in which we can be right with God the Father. And this fourth point is simply the glory of the Christian church. And that really ties in with what we're thinking about this morning. The glory of the Christian church. It is through the church that God works. It is through the church that, 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 that he draws people to himself, that he, that, that, that he works in the world. And so the glory of the Christian church. In Fort Rose Free Church, we have a high view of Scripture. We have a, a really high view of Scripture. Scripture is our authority. Scripture guides us and leads us in the direction that we go. It was one of the presidents of America, Ronald Reagan, who said, within the covers of the Bible are the answers to all the problems men face. You know, nowadays, or perhaps you, you can think before you were converted, if you're a Christian this morning, think back to uh, a time when you were looking at self-help books, uh, uh, thousands of self-help books that, that are available today, what, what, whatever the issue, uh, but, but self-help books are, are, are there and available, and perhaps we, we look to these, and, and the more that we look to self-help books, the, the more empty we felt, because they, 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 they couldn't 
uh, get the, 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 the itch that we had. They didn't scratch where the itch was, in other words. You know, for many of us, our Bibles are collecting dust on, on our shelves. Uh, what is shaping us is not God's Word, but the programs we watch on TV and what we take in and consume from social media. These are the th things that are shaping us and our children. Our children are learning that success is about coming first at any cost and at anyone's cost. And our children are learning that God is an optional extra. They're learning that we, 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 can, we can either have God in our lives or we can leave God and, and, and not have God in our lives and it doesn't really matter. And that is, that, that is the sad reality. Let me th finish off by an application. I want you to imagine just for a moment Mary. Uh, Mary was brought up in a, a family where the Bible was important. Uh, and she was taught uh, various sections of the Bible from a young age. And Mary came to that time where she needed to leave home. She had finished high school and she needed to go off to university in one of the big cities. Let's say Edinburgh. And so she prepared to go to Edinburgh. And one of the things that Mary noticed uh, when she left home and she, she left the context in which she was in, uh, one of the things that really struck her was that Scotland is a, is a secular country. Um, and, and within that context, that, that Scotland is, is a place where the Bible is not taken seriously. Uh, you know, even some of the churches that she went to, as she went into to, to try different churches out, she went to these churches uh, and often the message had nothing to do with the passage that was read. And another thing that Mary noticed uh, is that the preacher didn't really believe what came across to her. The preacher, when the, the message was given, the, the, the preacher didn't really believe what the Bible was saying. And Mary went on and joined a, a Bible-believing church. And when uh, the pressure was increased in her life at exam time and things got on top of her a, a little bit more than usual and some personal issues began to get to Mary and she became to, to be a little bit down because of these personal issues. She realized that she had a choice at that point. And one of the options that she could choose was to connect with a Bible-believing church, connect with the people within the church. And the second option that she had was to go the way of most of the people in her uni class, which was a really, in all intents and purposes, was a godless existence. And so Mary chooses option one. She connects with the church. She connects and makes friends within the church. And Mary finishes university after going through the, the ups and downs of university and, and city life. And at various times she reflects back at her time at university. And she, she reflects on the fact that it was her connection to the church that was her primary source of strength and stability through her time. That her relationship with her father, God developed through that time, despite everything that was going on in her life, with her connection into the church, her relationship with God developed and she grew as a Christian. And everything in her life was influenced by that relationship that she had with her father. And at various times in her life, as she grew up, Mary realized that when she wasn't connected with the church, the greater her sense of loneliness, anxiety, and emptiness was. 
But it was in the times when she was really connected in with the programs in the church, when she was feeding from the word of God, from the preaching of the gospel, that she was most secure and filled with the most hope. And so in the early church here in Acts, we, we, we see some of the characteristics of the church. There is unity and the good that comes out of that unity. And we notice the authority of the church was the word of God and how important the word of God was for that church. And prayer was for its leaders. And I wonder where you are this morning in terms of the Bible. Are, are you someone where the Bible is, is collecting dust on the shelf? You're perhaps even disconnected with the church. You're uh, maybe even going to church and, and yet you see yourself uh, in, in that individual setting. You, you, you realize that you, you, well, you think to yourself that you don't really need the church at all. And I would just encourage you this morning to connect, to truly connect. And the Bible promises us that as you connect with God's people and you are under the, 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 the sovereignty of God and under the teaching of the word of God, your relationship with God the Father will develop and you will grow and mature as a Christian. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice at the fact that you have not left us uh, without help and guidance for our faith and our lives. We thank you for scripture. We thank you for your word. Lord, may you continue to guide us and lead us in the way that you would have us go. And, you, and we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to carry on in our worship of God and we're going to sing in Psalm 107. Psalm 107 in the Scottish Psalter on page 382. In the Scottish Psalter, page 382. Uh, and um, Psalm 107, and we're going to sing verses 3 to 7 and verse 9. Verses 3 to 7 and verse 9. Let's sing to God's praise. <laughs> Friends, let's close in prayer with a benediction. Let's, let's pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Friends, thank you for listening. God bless.